Next up, I am incredibly excited to introduce David Schwartz, who's the CTO at Ripple and the co-creator of the XRP Ledger. Jazz and I were just talking backstage that David's one of those people, every time you hear him speak, you learn something new. Uh, and today, David will walk us through the continued evolution of the XRP Ledger. He'll start with his original vision and then highlight some recent technical updates before sharing new features. David, welcome. I'm gonna talk about XRP Ledger innovations, but first I wanna talk about what it's like to, what this experience has been, I think, for me and for all of us. I first became involved in the cryptocurrency space back in 2011 when I found Bitcoin. And it was right about that time that the first cracks were appearing in the proof of work narrative. I think a lot of people at that time had this view that I think we would consider naive today that, um, that proof of work would just be a, a, a sort of decentralizing force. That proof of work was the secret sauce behind Bitcoin, the thing that made it different, the thing that made it better. And the crack in that narrative, and it's obvious today, is that there are people who have cheaper power than other people, and there are people who have access to better ASICs than other people, and that it just can't be that sort of liberating, decentralizing force that I think we all thought it was. And that's why uh, we started working on a, a different way of coming to consensus, a different, a different method. And we developed Federated Byzantine Agreement, which is the method that powers the XRP ledger, leads to its reduced energy consumption, and gives it some of the properties that it has, the speed and the consistency. Um, you just heard Barath talking about the XRP Ledger Foundation, which was, um, which, you know, launched about a year ago. They just recently published their own XRP Ledger UNL, which um, we're fantastically excited about. COIL also publishes an XRP Ledger UNL. Uh, you probably heard the announcement of hooks. Um, we hear a lot about people who want smart contracts, people who want DeFi features on the XRP Ledger. And uh, today, most of those projects typically use Ethereum. Ethereum is a more general purpose blockchain than the XRP ledger is. You can do anything on Ethereum. The question is, can you do anything well? The problem is that because it is so general purpose, it has very high, it tends to have high fees and especially unpredictable fees, by which I mean um, the fee might be low one day and high the next day. Hooks is, a de is designed based on the XRP ledger philosophy. It's fixed function in the sense that um, it is not, uh, it's not Turing complete. You can't do anything with hooks. There are things you can do on Ethereum that you can't do on hooks, but there's a lot of things that you can do on hooks. And because it's designed based on that sort of more limited function philosophy, it shouldn't produce the kind of performance problems and fee problems that Ethereum's implementation produces. It's uh, much more efficient and adds smart contract-like capabilities to the XRPL where the ledger can respond to, the pay to a payment in a decentralized way. XLS 14 was recently proposed, uh, I think by Weetzy Wind. It's a standard to issue NFTs on the XRP ledger. Um, I think he would agree that it's not a great standard, it's a good standard. It's kind of like colored coins on Bitcoin. Bitcoin was never designed to support any token other than Bitcoin. And colored coins is kind of a little bit of a hack to make Bitcoin support other types of coins. Uh, but Bitcoin support for other coins didn't really take off very much. Other blockchains took on that role because they were more optimized for them. XLS 14 allows the XRP ledger to support NFTs, but it is a little bit of a square peg in a round hole. Uh, the great thing about it was it just works. You can use it today. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more later about efforts that are going on now to provide something better than what, uh, what XLS 14 gives you. Negative UNL is a feature that I am incredibly excited about, but it's very difficult for me to convey that excitement without, uh, it's a little bit bittersweet. It's kind of like if you invented a technology that would make it less likely for a nuclear reactor to melt down. Like how would the nuclear reactor industry promote that development, right? They would have to talk about how horrible meltdowns are <laughs> to tell you how great the technology is. And of course, they don't want to do that, right? Nobody in the nuclear reactor industry wants to talk about how bad a meltdown is. They want to pretend that they don't exist. But let's be honest, blockchains have failure modes. Bitcoin, for example, has a double spend. Bitcoin had an unintentional fork in 2013. Um, Ethereum had the, had the DAO attack. There are residual failure modes in blockchains, and I think it is important that we continue to innovate to reduce the odds of them happening and reduce their severity, even if it is a bit embarrassing for the industry to point the finger at these failure modes. 
And there is a residual failure mode in the XRP ledger, which is if too many validators fail, before humans can respond to it, the ledger could halt its forward progress. That is a residual failure mode. It's somewhat analogous to the double spend risk or reorganization risk in Bitcoin. Uh, the consequences tend to be less. They tend to be a halting of the ledger. So nobody loses money directly, but you, you want maximum reliability for ledger. You don't, you, don't, you don't want it to halt. So the way the negative UNL feature works, and I think this is important, is it does not change consensus at all. This is something very important to understand. So it has no impact on any of the XRP ledger's attributes that come from consensus. That includes its censorship resistance, and that includes its sort of decentralization, its fairness, amendment voting, fee voting, the other things that validators do. Negative UNL is implemented exclusively through the uh, validation mechanism. To use a Bitcoin analogy for people not familiar with the sort of technical details of the XRP ledger, if you think about like Bitcoin's decentralization and fairness properties, they come from the mining and the production of blocks. But the final validation, like the resistance to reorganizations, comes from each individual participant's decision when to consider a transaction final. They may wait for six confirmations. Negative UNL impacts the part of the XRP ledger that's analogous to waiting for confirmations. And that is not where the decentralization or censorship resistance comes from because those are, exclus those are, um, those are exclusively local properties, right? It's a local decision when to accept a transaction. Uh, we're decarbonizing the XRP ledger. The XRP ledger is the first blockchain uh, to be fully decarbonized. You're never going to see that happen for proof of work blockchains. Um, I, kind of, I kind of have a hard time convincing people that we're serious about this sometimes. Um, one of the arguments that they make is like, well, people, you know, they fly around in private jets, so do they really care about decarbonizing the XRP ledger? Um, yes, we're serious. Yes, we do really care. And I'll make an argument that I, I hate that I have to make this, but I think it's worth making that even if you aren't serious about the you know, climate change, and even if you aren't serious about saving the planet, and even if you think that there's hypocrisy in you know, wealthy countries, you know, people in wealthy countries talking about decarbonization, don't forget that the costs of proof of work are borne by the user of the system. When you, when you use Bitcoin or when you use Ethereum, your transaction fees are going to, mine, uh, to miners who then pay them to electric companies and ASIC manufacturers. So uh, you should, even just as a selfish user of the, that blockchain, you should care. And I'm sure many of you have heard the narrative that Ethereum's fees mean that it's very useful, it's very popular, like that people are paying a lot of fees for it. But it's important to keep in mind that fees are residual friction that have not been removed by the system. So I'll use a bit of an analogy. If you think about eBay, eBay removes friction between buyers and sellers. If I'm selling something and you want to buy it, we, it we, if we could find each other directly and we had a payment system and a reputation system that we could use, we wouldn't use eBay. We'd save a lot of money. You don't use eBay to sell something to your neighbors. But, we, but you do use eBay because it removes friction in cases where those direct sales are not possible. And it's easy to say that the more money eBay makes, well, the more friction they must be removing. But just remember, every dollar that eBay makes is a dollar that a buyer spent and that a seller didn't get. It's residual friction. If you're a user of eBay, you want them to make as little money as possible because that money is either leaving your pocket or not going into your pocket. So it is the users of systems like Ethereum who are paying those fees. If you use Ethereum, you're paying for its, for its energy consumption. And I think also it's become clear that proof of work does not deliver on uh, some of the promises that we thought it would deliver. It doesn't, it doesn't, it is not a decentralizing force. It just doesn't. Bitcoin's decentralization comes from the fact that the transaction data is public. Bitcoin's decentralization comes from the fact that everybody knows how every transaction is supposed to work and everybody knows the consequences of every transaction. It doesn't come from how it solves the double spend problem. Light accounts are uh, a feature that's been proposed to lower the XRP ledger account reserve requirements. Um, many of you probably know that the XRP ledger reserve requirements recently dropped from 20 XRP to 10 XRP by validator vote and sort of by community demand. The reason for the account reserve is that an account on the XRP ledger is a real thing. It's different from a Bitcoin uh, receiving address. When you have a receiving address in Bitcoin, that receiving address isn't really represented in the system. There's no account that it represents. There's sort of a collection of funds. Each chunk of funds, as far as Bitcoin is concerned, sort of has an independent life. 
The XRP ledger works more like Ethereum now does. It has, a, you have an account that has a balance and that has parameters you can set. And that gives you some capabilities that are not possible on other blockchains. Like for example, let's say you're a charity and you give out a receiving address in Bitcoin. And maybe you're not very sophisticated in Bitcoin, so you've hired some firm to take your Bitcoin receipts and convert them into your local currency. They have the key to your receiving address. They have to in order to make that work. And if you want to change that to that company or you want to, maybe you want to self custody or you don't, you want to hold on to Bitcoin, you want to hold instead of, you know, selling as you receive, you need to change your receiving address to a new one that that previous party that you contracted with doesn't know the key to. And that's very painful. Uh, XRP ledger accounts are real things. They have properties that you can change, including such things like the key that signs them. So you can actually change the key on the account. You can rekey the account without having to create a new account. But that associates a cost with, um, with an account on the XRP ledger that most other blockchains don't have. And to mitigate that cost, there's a reserve, which is not a really a fee you pay, but it's a balance that you have to have. And if you have that balance, you, you, know, you can create an account. Light accounts um, require a smaller reserve. And the way they do that is kind of interesting. Most accounts pay the reserve, but they don't use any of the features that the reserve sort of covers the cost of. Because those features are free once you have an account, you kind of have to pay for them up front. Otherwise, a malicious party could create a large number of accounts that use all of those features, and they could use a lot of ledger space at, at very low cost. Light accounts are limited in function. They can't do all of the things that full function accounts can do. Uh, but they can receive and hold XRP, they can transfer it, they can make payments. Uh, and they have a much lower reserve. In the current proposal, their reserve would be one XRP, which is one-tenth of the current XRP, the current reserve for a full account. I, I think a lot of people have said that the reserve is an obstacle to adoption of the XRP ledger, the fact that you have to have 10 XRP. Maybe for most of the people in this room, it's not a big obstacle, but if you think about trying to drive more mass adoption, particularly in countries that are not as wealthy, uh, it, it is a big obstacle. And also just having money that, that's yours that you can't access like ever is just, it's not a great, it's not a great user experience. So let's, uh, let's look ahead at the future of the XRP ledger and where we're going. I think today we're going to announce the first release of federated sidechains. Federated sidechains are not a new, they're not a new concept. There are federated sidechains out there, but the way we've implemented them for the XRP ledger is a little bit different. A federated sidechain can be based on any technology. It can be based on the XRP ledger technology or it can be different. I think it's most interesting where it uses the XRP ledger's consensus algorithms, but it can have completely different transaction semantics. One of the first applications of federated sidechains will probably be uh, Ethereum virtual machine chains. That is a sidechain that implements the Ethereum virtual machine, but they can, transact, they can move tokens to and from the XRP ledger. So what makes them federated is that ability to move tokens. They're operated by a federation. I'm sure most of you have seen Star Trek. You know what a federation is, right? It's a group of entities that are, are distinct and don't necessarily completely trust each other, but they cooperate to achieve some objective that they couldn't achieve as easily on their own or couldn't achieve it all on their own. And they have well-defined roles for the federation versus the roles for the individual participant. And that's what federated sidechains do. And they use that federation to move tokens onto and off of the federated sidechain. I expect that federated sidechains will make available new applications that are, have not been previously possible for the XRP ledger. And a big one is going to be uh, more powerful DeFi. We have a decentralized exchange built into the XRP ledger. We had the first decentralized exchange, uh, probably late 2012. Um, but that's about the, that, the, there were not the full, sort of full DeFi functions that you could get from an Ethereum virtual machine sidechain or a sidechain more uh, tuned towards DeFi features. I think another important thing is horizontal scalability. Blockchains fundamentally have transaction limits. That, that we're, I, 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 I hesitate to say never, but I think it's the one thing that we don't have a really good plan to solve anywhere in this industry is scalability. I, I've pitched blockchains for applications where many people would never use a blockchain, but the one thing that I come back to is that like if throughput and transactions per second is your driving metric, it's very difficult to choose a blockchain technology because we haven't figured out how to scale them yet. And horizontal scalability is one way to do that. So the idea is this. Let's say you have a, a, you have a chain that has some huge capacity, 10,000 transactions per second, but you still want more than that. If you can horizontally create 100 such chains, and you can have, do two hop transactions, well now your transaction throughput has gone way up. Yes, you need two transactions instead of one, 
but you have the, the transaction capacity of all of these chains added together. So that horizontal scalability is big. And I think another important thing is the way that this is going to inspire developers. Developers will uh, be able to innovate right at the blockchain layer. So when you build on top of Ethereum, you get a lot of things from the Ethereum ecosystem, right? You don't have to worry about transaction formats. You don't have to worry about transaction execution rules. You don't have to worry, you have access to ERC-20 tokens. You can interoperate with the rest of the ecosystem, but you pay a heavy price for that. You're stuck with Ethereum's fee model. You're stuck with the Ethereum virtual machine. You're stuck with the storage that Ethereum gives you, and you're stuck with its costs. And if that's a good deal for you, then you should build on Ethereum. But if it's not, and for many people it's not, especially where transaction fees you know, are in over $100 in many cases, um, a better set of trade-offs is necessary. And the way to make those trade-offs however you want is to innovate at that very lowest layer to essentially build your own blockchain. And you can think of federated sidechains as a toolkit for building your own blockchain. And that will allow people to innovate right at those lowest layers. Another thing that you can do is you can use it as a sort of test lab. Let's say there's some feature, hooks might be a good example, that you think should be adopted on the XRP ledger. Well, you have to implement it. And you kind of have to convince people that it works and that it won't do harm. And it's very difficult to do that if you can't handle real money with it. You know, you can build a blockchain as a test. You can build a sort of a, a, a quarantine network, an experimental network, and people are not motivated to attack it. They're, they're, they're not, they're not going to bother focusing resources on it because there's no money to be had. If you first handle real money and, you know, and it's billions of dollars, I think we've all seen some of the disasters in the industry with projects that scaled up to huge amounts of money before they had the technical wherewithal to be able to handle those amounts. I think it's responsible uh, what Flare did where they built Songbird and Songbird is handling real money but it's not sort of their live network. It's like a, an experimental and test network where you can sort of fail more gracefully. But if it succeeds, then Flare will launch with much more confidence. And this is kind of the same idea. You can build a federated sidechain with some feature that you want to propose for inclusion in the XRP ledger, and you can handle real money with it. You don't have to, you can, you, you have, but you have a switch that you can flip whenever you're ready to handle real money. And then when you're arguing that that feature should be included in the XRP ledger, you have something that you can show that you, that you can show that the feature is, it, it's not gonna make the validators crash. It's not gonna slow the network down. It's not gonna blow up the fees exponentially. It's not gonna eat up memory or CPU. It's not, it's gonna work. You've proven that it's worked and you've proven that it can withstand a hostile attack because it's handling real money. And I think that's going to excite developers uh, in, a, in, in, in much the same way that Ethereum did. This idea that we can innovate not on top of you know, a whole bunch of technical decisions that have already made for us that are irrevocable and that limit us, but in an environment where we can experiment with changing those very bottom technical decisions. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Chris. That was great. And I believe David's gonna come back up and join us for a few more remarks. Thanks, David. It hurt me. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't tell any jokes, not, not one. I am known for always starting my presentation with a joke. I always do that. I didn't do it. People don't always laugh at them, but I always do. And when Monica told me that we were going to have this crypto developer conference in Las Vegas, I said, Las Vegas? Finally, something in Las Vegas that caters to people who aren't bad at math. Hey, all right, I tried, okay, I tried. All right, wait, try another one, try another one, try another one. I have a strong personal connection to Las Vegas. When I was a kid, my parents went to Las Vegas for the weekend. They, went to, they drove to Las Vegas in a $16,000 Toyota Tracel, and they came back in a shiny, brand new, $250,000 Greyhound bus. All right, yeah, eh, maybe not the right audience. I, while I'm up here, I wanna talk about two things that I didn't talk about before. I want to talk a little bit more about NFTs. We hear from just about everybody that they want an NFT strategy. A lot of people aren't sure exactly what they want it for, but they know they want it. And there are a lot of people who do know, know exactly what they want it for. They're, they're, they're all in, they're bought in, they're going big on them. The XRP ledger has some features that will make it fantastic for NFTs. So you have low transaction cost, you have high confirmation speed, and you have a sort of lightweight ledger design. The design of the XRP ledger's internal database is very, very, is, it's, just up, it's just really good for NFTs. We put forward a proposal, um, three people at Ripple, 
for an NFT standard on the XRP ledger that's built uh, for scale and for volume. We think we're gonna see broad adoption of that, of that standard, and that's going to power new use cases into the future. I don't think we know exactly what those NFT use cases are going to be yet. I think some of them are obvious. Gaming is obvious, collectibles is obvious. But I think there's a sort of entire universe of NFT applications that people don't really see yet that are going to be very, very big. If you think about it, we all sort of own lots of digital rights. There's all kinds of digital rights that you own. You own digital rights to movies, to video games, to objects in games, and I think it's not just the obvious ones, like the mass market ones, like movies and songs. Uh, your right to that song or that movie could be an NFT that you could take with you from market to market. So this is, this is an extremely exciting area. The other thing that I wanted to talk about is automated market making. Um, as I mentioned before, the XRP ledger is the OG DEX. You know, we had a DEX in 2012. We have cross-currency payments. We have issued assets. Um, we, we built the XRP ledger. We designed it, and other people have extended it with the payments use case in mind. And that payment use case is a cross-currency payment world. It's a world where some people like dollars, some people like euros, some people like Bitcoin, some people like XRP. It's a multi-token world, it's a tokenized world where maybe other types of assets are, token, are tokenized. And liquidity is sort of the secret, uh, the secret sauce to making that work. I think personally my earliest vision that I think has held uh, for, for 10 years now was this idea of sort of public pools of liquidity. In existing payment systems, you're stuck with that payment system's liquidity. If you use Western Union, you get their cash in, you get their cash out, you get their liquidity whether you like it or not, and you can't unbundle those things. That early vision was these pools of liquidity that everybody can contribute to and everybody can draw off that are kind of unbundled from the payment system or the asset that you're using to pay with. Automated market makers, I think, will help improve that liquidity because they can capture a long tail of assets better than technologies like order books can. Uh, we've been working uh, with the community on an automated market maker implementation for the XRP ledger. And uh, today, for the first time, I think I'm going to let the world know that it has a mechanism that I don't believe exists in any other automated market maker design in the world that allows the stakers, the people who put the liquidity into the automated market maker, to command a larger share of the profits that would normally go to arbitragers, uh, increasing the return. Um, I do want to talk about why I think that, that the XRP ledger is uniquely suited to exploit that type of technology. Uh, automated market makers have a loose profit to arbitragers. Essentially, as the price of assets change, the market maker doesn't know that the price is different, and so it sort of makes trades at a loss. Arbitragers make those trades at a loss to sort of rebalance the AMM, causing what is sometimes called impermanent loss. Although, whether or not it's impermanent is uh, up, up for debate. Now, the, there are certain mechanisms that maximize the, the penalty that that causes, and there are certain mechanisms that minimize them. And the XRP ledger has three factors that weren't intended for automated market makers. They were intended for payments, but they significantly improve the efficiency of automated market makers and increase the return. And one of those is speed. If you're arbitraging against an automated market maker, you don't know the state of the ledger at the time your transaction executes. You only know the state of the ledger at the time you create your transaction. So you have this latency period during which the price could change or the ledger state could change. With Ethereum, that could be several minutes. With the XRP ledger, that's typically just a couple of seconds. So that's a significant sort of inherent feature of the XRP ledger that makes arbitragers arbitrage more efficiently and the more, uh, the earlier and the quicker an arbitrager arbitrages, the less the loss the pool suffers. If an arbitrager waits until the profits are large, that means the losses are big, right? You want an arbitrager to arbitrage as soon as there's an arbitrage opportunity, which is the second feature. If it costs you $50 to arbitrage on Ethereum and a, less than a penny to arbitrage on the XRP ledger, you're gonna make your arbitrage transaction more quickly. You're not going to wait until the, pro the potential profit is enormous and therefore the potential loss to the pool is also enormous. So the fact that the XRP ledger fees are lower is going to mean more of those mo that money that would go to arbitragers stays with the people who are staking the pool. And that's what you want, because you want you, if people don't stake the pool, there's no liquidity. You want the stakers to reap the rewards of their staking so that there will be these deep pools of liquidity. And the third feature is fairness. Uh, how many of you here know what MEV is? No hands, okay, well, well, one or two, okay. I've got a couple over there, I think those might be Ripple employees. But MEV is what uh, Ethereum miners do sometimes, and they have no choice. Mining is cutthroat. 
If I can make more money mining than you can, I'm gonna grow my mining operation. I'm gonna put you out of business by raising the difficulty. If you can make extra money mining, you pretty much have to. You have no choice. You, you have to do it, because otherwise you'll go out of business. And one of the ways that miners can make more money is by gaming automated market makers and decentralized exchanges. They essentially front run. They essentially, they say, oh, I'm not gonna execute this transaction, and I'm not gonna execute this transaction, but ooh, I am gonna execute this transaction, even though it paid a low fee, because if I put my own transaction in front of it, I can make a profit. Most of those profits are user losses. I mean, to some extent, this part of it is to some extent a zero-sum game, right? A front runner who makes money from a trader is taking money out of the trader's pocket. And you can't do that on the XRP ledger because the federated Byzantine agreement algorithm doesn't have one, there's no miner, there's no one sort of dictator of the moment who gets to decide what goes in the block. And so those three features of the XRP ledger that it's had you know, forever uh, make automated market makers work much, much better. And then with the mechanism that we're working on that will allow them the pool to recapture much of the profits that the arbitrage uh, makes, almost as if the pool were arbitraging against in itself, we're hopeful that that will incentivize very, very deep pools of liquidity on the XRP ledger that will make movement between tokens uh, very efficient. Um, so, XR, so that could be, I think that could be a game changer. I also want to talk a little bit about bridges. The entire crypto industry is building toward a multi-chain future where every network is optimized for a specific use case. The XRP ledger was built for payments. Ethereum was optimized for smart contracts and sort of it can do anything and that's why a lot of DeFi is built on ETH to this day. More exchanges are looking to DeFi to create interoperable experiences for their users to alleviate network congestion and the ability to operate crypto across networks has become increasingly critical. I think you could even imagine NFTs that could move between blockchains. Uh, I think we already have like NFT bridges. You have, an, you have a premium NFT that lives on Ethereum you know, people think, well, Ethereum is a premium blockchain right now, but you could move it on other blockchains um, and then someone can sort of move it back and then reclaim it on Ethereum. And you can have this world where that NFT can transact rapidly at low speed. You can have auctions and other features. You don't have to pay $35 to $100 in gas. Meanwhile, the, the real, the sort of real NFT is on Ethereum. So bridges are not just for tokens, for, for fungible tokens. They're not just for money. They're really for almost any asset that can live on a ledger. And that will allow networks with complementary use cases to work together to solve much more complex uh, solutions. I think I mentioned earlier that we're announcing the first release of the federated sidechain feature uh, today. So developers will be able to more easily build bridges to other currencies that will allow this sort of combined world where you can transact on the blockchain that's best for my use case, you can transact on the blockchain that's best for your use case, and we can interoperate. All right, should I have more jokes? Well, no, I think not. They told me I'd get fired if I told, uh, if I, they, they, in fact, I, I'll tell you, I ran one joke by a couple of people at Ripple, and they said, I'm not joking, they said, Monica will literally run up there and stab you. So if you want to see that joke, come see me privately. Thank you.